Tonight, we're going to finish our review of the Old Testament books. And Wednesday night, we will begin a series that will be on Wednesday nights and the Sunday morning Bible class on the Sermon on the Mount. So we'll be reading the first 16 verses of Matthew 5 between now and uh, Wednesday night as we begin that series. We'll not take huge amounts uh, through those three chapters of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but I think it will be a study that will help us all, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'll be here Wednesday night and all day next Sunday and the next Wednesday night. But uh, between Wednesday night and Sunday of this week, I'm going a long ways off to West Virginia. In St. Albans, West Virginia, they've had a lectureship every year at this time. It begins on Tuesday and ends on Friday. That's sort of unusual. But brethren from all over three states, at least, maybe four, come there. And I've been there 12 of the 15 years. And this time, they really have a good study on the goodness and severity of God. And I get in there, Lord willing, about... Uh, two o'clock on uh, Thursday and preach that night at uh, eight, the next morning at 10 and that night then at seven and then return on Saturday, the Lord willing. <clears throat> and it's really an interesting thing to remember that when the restoration movement came and there was division later by the liberals and the conservatives over instrumental music, the missionary society and women's role in the church, the only place in the United States where the good guys won and kept the building was West Virginia. Nearly every place else, the liberals took the building and through legal twists and turns ran the, sand, uh, ran the sound brethren out. And I've always admired the brethren in West Virginia, and there's one thing that's so characteristic of them. In fact, I've had, been asked many times why I didn't move there. Uh, that was probably by people in Texas that would had a wishful thought, like, why don't you move? And we'll help load the van. But uh, because uh, they, you just can't preach the Bible too plainly for them. And that's almost without exception. To find a liberal in the church of the Lord in West Virginia, you have to look pretty closely. And it's really inter interesting to work with brethren like that. They're very down to earth. And I look forward to that and uh, meeting people I've thought so much of for so many years. So I want you to remember that I represent this congregation when I go elsewhere, and I want your prayers for safe travel there and back. Uh, the mountain you fly off of in Charleston, West Virginia, is where the Marshall football team died, about 58 or 60 of them about 20 years ago coming back from a game. It's a difficult place to land and take off, and especially in the fog. I've sat there on the end of that runway for an hour and a half waiting for the fog to lift because I leave early on Saturday morning, usually, and always miss my connection in Atlanta. So uh, you might want to pray. Well, however you pray, uh, you know, <laughs> like I get stuck there and enjoy preaching there the rest of my life. Iris can come by mule train to join me. If I act like I'm tired tonight, I am. We've been in the car nearly six hours today, going back and forth from where we preached out in the near Hamilton, Texas, between Hamilton and Lampasas, and you look that up on the map, it's a long ways. And I nearly went to sleep and didn't wake up this afternoon. I had an hour at home. But tonight we're taking Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last six Old Testament prophets called the Minor Prophets, and we're having one main point out of each of those books. And I think we're going to see how they mesh together and really form good material on Christian living from the Old Testament prophets. Man's inhumanity to man has always been in displeasure with God. He didn't appreciate those in Amos and Micah's days who would so sell the poor for a pair of shoes and would covet the dust on a man's head as so, so much real estate he could sell. They really had uh, false weights and balances. They really enjoyed cheating their fellow man in business transactions. And so the Old Testament prophets stopped to talk about that a lot of the time. So I hope that uh, we can say something as we point out one major point from each of these six books to show that people haven't changed much, Satan hasn't changed at all, and sin is still sin, and the appeal to righteousness is a very rare thing. The book of Nahum might well be the least known book in the entire Bible. I would say that many people, many brethren, have never, ever read that little short book. One of the outstanding points in the Old Testament, though, is Nahum 1 verse 3. God will in no wise clear the guilty. Now judges do. Divorce grant, divorce grant, divorce grant. Not according to God's will, but the judge machinery. 
And many, many people are cleared who are guilty because they're good old boys. Some of the biggest crooks in American history were sorry as they could be, but because they put money in the coffers of some people, they didn't want anything to happen to their benefactor, even if he is crooked as a dog's hind leg, as we used to say. God will in no wise clear the guilty. I've known preachers, though, who tried to clear the guilty as if they had the power to do it. There are some men who will preach marriage, divorce, or remarriage, however the audience likes it and however it fits different audiences. One preacher of 50 years said, I haven't quite decided yet what the Bible teaches on marriage, divorce, or remarriage. Well, how many more years, how many more half centuries does he need? That's one of the clearest teachings in the whole Bible. But 1,300,000 divorces are granted in America every year, and very, 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 very few are scriptural. But judges and lawyers in their chicanery and their shiftlessness and their sharp, wonderful-sounding words clear the guilty. But in the day of judgment, the guilty will not be cleared. Their name will not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, I learned a long, long time ago when I first started preaching, in the third year of my preaching, and the first year of full-time preaching, that uh, you're going to get in more trouble when you take a stand on marriage, divorce, or remarriage, or whom you will perform a wedding ceremony for, and nearly anything. I had a little old guy on the parking lot of the Meadowbrook building in Fort Worth years ago. He was ready to whip me. And any, anybody could whip me. A little old woman with a broomstick could beat me half to death, you know. But he thought it was something great to sort of challenge me because I wouldn't perform his daughter's wedding even though he knew where I stood. I guess he thought I'd make an exception. But any time I move to a place, I tell the elders before I meet, before I move there, what my stand is on controversial matters. And the marriage ceremonies I will not perform. And so if they let me come and work with them, it's in spite of my plain speech. Then the first sermon, I preach, is uh, the work of a gospel preacher, what it is and what it isn't. That goes over real big with some people. And I tell about my view on December 25th and uh, uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage, and all the little things that seem to be controversial, though to me they're not. And I want people to know and be fully aware of my idiosyncrasies. Of course, I can't list them all because you only preach about 40 minutes. But the point is, it isn't that we come in uh, the back door sideways and apologize for what we believe and leave them in the dark about it. But you can get in more trouble by trying to clear the guilty and plea and to please weak brothers and sisters, especially about their kids, than anything else. What kind of a gospel preacher would I be if I just went where the wind blew me? If I taught what you want me to hear and you want me to hear and they want me to hear and those want me to hear, I wouldn't be a gospel preacher. I wouldn't be God's preacher. And so when you decide, I will be consistently a gospel preacher, and you stick with it, you already know coming out, you're not going to please everybody. So we cannot clear the guilty. We just have to preach the truth. If that hits the guilty, it hits them. Woe unto the preacher, elder, member, that tries to clear the guilty so they'll be popular and well-received. I wonder how men like that can sleep at night. Looks like they have a guilty conscience every minute of every day. They're not God's preacher. They're man's preacher. Paul said, I now seek to please men or God. If I were yet pleasing men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. Jesus said in Luke 6.26, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers unto the false prophets. And my favorite little statement is, He who trims himself to suit everyone soon whittles himself away. Do we want to be a gospel preacher or the people's preacher? See, I, I'm the kind of preacher that will even tell brethren I don't want a present during the Xmas season. My people think that's almost heresy. We always give a special present to our preacher. We give him extra money. And so I'm just a human being. I'm not a clergyman. And I wonder about men who will be clergymen on certain occasions. I was answering questions on Bible Forum, three preachers every Sunday night out on a Midland station years and years ago. And they asked the people a question about the clergy. And the teachers on there said, oh, we don't believe in the clergy lady system. And I said, then why? I said, why do you have a clergy card in your billfold so you can get a cheaper ticket at the picture show? I believe somebody needs to ask them that. Do you think they enjoyed that? Not much. But a lot of people called me and wrote me and said, I didn't know that. Anyone speak up on things like that? It's amazing how we can compromise on things that are comfortable and easy for us that violate what we teach publicly. 
And so God will in no wise clear the guilty. And the sooner the guilty admit they're guilty and make it right with God, whatever that costs, the happier they're going to be in the day of judgment. Did you listen to Ned's prayer carefully? He took us to the judgment bar of God about three times. He mentioned the torment of hell, the joy and peace and glory of heaven. But do you think we're just going to walk up there and say, uh, give me heaven, I'm a good guy and I want to go to heaven all my life. Oh, I'm guilty of a lot of things I never made right, but Lord, open up the gates and here I come. If I got news for them. It's not going to be like that. We're not going to be in charge in the day of judgment. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Habakkuk, the passage Ned read from chapter 2, verses 15 to 20, speaks of the emptiness, the uselessness, the vanity of idols made with men's hands. He said, When Babylon comes, do you think those idols you've made with your hands who don't have any hands of their own? Or any ability to speak are going to turn them back. What are those idols going to do? Those dumb idols you worship, you bow down before. They don't have ears to hear. They don't have a mouth to speak. They don't have arms to turn the armies of Babylon back. They're just vain machinery you made with your hands. And you're a human being. A long way from God Almighty. What are you going to do? He said, instead of talking to those idols that can't hear you. And can't talk to you. And can't protect you. Why don't you hush and let God talk to you? That's what Habakkuk 2.20 means. God's in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. I've been in many a congregation when they had uh, vacation Bible school and the children were dismissed from the assembly to go to the classes. They'd sing tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house and quote Habakkuk 2.20. If I got news for all of us, that's not what that verse is talking about. It means all your lifetime. Hush and let God do the talking. Don't talk to dumb idols that you made with your own hands. They can't help you. But God's in His holy temple. And 1 Kings 8.39 says, His temple, the holy of holies, heaven itself. And so the vanity of idolatry and the machinery back of it and the mindset that accepts it. You know something you'll learn when you study the subject of idolatry in the Bible and in encyclopedias? Everyone who had an idol bowed down to built into that idol their own weaknesses so they'd feel comfortable around the God they worship. If they were licentious and evil like Corinth with 1,100 female priests, this says, uh, bowing down to Aphrodite, their God, and committing adultery in the name of Aphrodite in their temple. Why? Because they were adulterers. They were fornicators. And so they made an idol like them so they'd be comfortable with that kind of a God, quote, unquote, little G. It's so typical. In Athens, when Paul saw the idolatry of the Athenians and his spirit stirred within him, Acts 17, 16, he said, now see, you even have an unknown God, meaning if we forgot anybody, here's one that will represent the one we may have forgotten. And he said, the times of this ignorance, and I can see him sweeping his hand toward the idols, God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. But did you know covetousness is idolatry? Colossians 3, 5. So some of us who don't have fashion with our hands are bought in the shop somewhere, little busts of idols we bow down to can still have idols in our heart, as Ezekiel 14 says. And so, hush. But another passage in the back of 2 2 says, Write this message and make it so plain that those who run may read it. We need to be that plain in our preaching and our writing. Make it so plain that those who run may read it. I think I've told you before, it may have been in West Virginia, a lady came in and said, I've been reading your articles in Gospel Minutes for years and years, and said, you preach just like you're right. I was about to thank her, and she said, obnoxious. Word for word. I don't know yet whether she's kidding or not, but some people probably amen to right there on the spot. We need to make it so plain that people won't misunderstand what we're talking about. I wonder and worry about brethren who want the preaching to be vague and indefinite and uncertain with a hollow ring to it that accommodates our weaknesses. Instead of challenges us, as some say, steps on our toes. How can a man be a gospel preacher and preach very much Bible and not get on all of our toes, including his own? One reason I've preached plainly all my preaching life, and it's now about 54 years, is because I need it. And I wouldn't think as much gospel that didn't step on my toes. You don't have to go very long to hit me. And so make it so plain that those who run may read it. Then to Zephaniah. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of God's wrath. Zephaniah 1.18. Do 
Did you know nearly every commentary you'll read on that verse says there's two possible answers to the silver and gold there. One really means silver and gold. The other means images or idols you made with silver and gold who cannot deliver you in the day of God's wrath. But it works either way because, again, covetousness is idolatry. And the rich fool of Luke 12 worshipped his possessions, thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I'll tear down my barns, build greater barns, and I'll say to my soul, soul, take thy knees. That's much good as laid up for many years. But God said, you are a fool. Tonight your soul will be required of you. And then who shall these things be that you've made? So whatever it is and to what extent our wealth may go, our earthly toil and reward, it won't deliver us the day of God's wrath. You can't take it with you. We need to understand that money does not buy happiness. They have a sign over there by Garland when you turn off of uh, 635 or 20 on to 635. Uh, it's wrong English. It says uh, uh, don't instead of doesn't. But the idea is you don't you cannot take it with you. Well, whatever that means and whatever he's talking about there, we won't take anything. Naked came out of the world, naked shall I return, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 121. So whatever it is we trust in and worship and devote our energies to won't get through the judgment. Remember what uh, Peter told Simon the sorcerer, your money will go to perdition with you. Now some of you have modern speech translations that's more striking than that. Your money will go to hell with you. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, if you lay up treasures on earth, moth and rust can corrupt and thieves can break through and steal. We probably ought to live, as I've often said, that if anyone broke into our house, they'd leave a sympathy card and a $5 bill. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be very few things they'd want to take out of there, you know. But the point is, we need to quit trusting in silver and gold. But I believe he could be talking about idols because in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 20 in the New Testament, he said, you're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold received by vain tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. And he speaks of Jesus as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, laid his life down, and it's through his shed blood we're redeemed. Not anything we own or possess or desire or covet. Not any accumulation of wealth, whatever it is, small or great. Cannot save your soul. Can you imagine some of these people standing before God in judgment, said, you know who I am and where I came from and what my pedigree is and who my kinfolks are. Highway Patrolmen have heard that all their life. They'll stop somebody about to ride out a ticket and say, uh, do you know uh, who I am, who my father is? You know my family and their name and their wealth and their importance. Says, you know who I am? And the fellow just keeps riding. I love the story of the highway patrolman that stopped this big black limousine down by College Station years ago and had the tinted windows where you couldn't see who was inside. This highway patrolman pulled this fellow off and the man rolled down his window and it was a Catholic priest. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm riding you out a ticket. What for? For speeding, going 70 miles in a 35 mile zone. That's dangerous. He said, you know who I am? He said, I'll have you know I'm Father Fox. He said, I don't care if you're Mother Goose. So I'm going to give you this ticket. <laughs> well, that may be an extreme illustration, but... In the day of judgment, we'll all stand on level ground to put the cross and be judged by the word of God, whether we're rich or poor, mighty, famous, unknown, worthless, as worldly standards go, or the magnificent one of a community. Makes no difference who we are, what our name is, where we came from. We'll be judged according to the word of God, John 12, 48. That's fair, isn't it? We all stand on level ground to put the cross and you can't buy your way into heaven. And then the book of Haggai, which is a personal favorite of mine. I think Habakkuk and Haggai, for real small, short books, have more meat and more richness in their wording. But my very favorite phrase in Haggai is when God said, From this day will I bless you. See, they've been home from captivity for many years, at least 16 years. And they promised when they got back home they'd rebuild the temple. That's why they went back home. The temple of Nebuchadnezzar had burned and sacked and virtually destroyed. And so the first year they laid the foundation, it looked like they were off to a burning start. And for the next 15 years, they stole the cedars of Lebanon that had been imported to refurbish the temple and made their own sealed, magnificent, paneled houses while the temple of God lieth waste. That's the wording of Haggai. But Haggai came along as a bold preacher, and in 24 days, they accomplished more than they had in 16 previous years. He must have really been a blockbuster preacher. He got the bread into working. 
It's like Nehemiah said, so built we the wall because the people had a mind to work. <laughs> Nehemiah didn't rebuild it. Haggai didn't rebuild the temple. That was the motivation and incentive to build a fire on the folk who had forgotten the promises. And God said, when you do, I will. From this day, I will bless you. Don't you know to those older people who wonder if that temple will ever be rebuilt before they died, though they compared it with Solomon's magnificent, ornate cathedral temple, don't you know that thrilled their soul? You've now finally gotten back to what you promised God, and from this day, I will bless you. A young man came to me several years ago, and he said, everything I've tried has failed. I said, no, there's one thing you haven't tried. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he began to do that, and all of a sudden in six weeks, and certainly in six months, he was doing better than he had ever done before. He hadn't done everything he could do. He hadn't put the kingdom of God first. So we need to stop and think. And of course, a lot of times, everything I tried came to naught only refers to the material or our job, our houses, our pocketbooks, our money in the bank, and so forth. But for those who know God, who say, I've tried everything, who haven't tried Matthew 6, 33, they ought to think again. From this day will I bless you. i tell again the story of a man who came home from work one day all frazzled and bedazzled, and his wife said, what's the matter with you? He said, everything I touched today went sour. Everything I tried just didn't work out. She said, you didn't pray, did you? He said, how do you know? And she said, because Jesus said in John 15, verses 4 and 5, without me, you can do nothing. Doesn't it make a lot of difference when we seek first the kingdom of God in our business and everything we do? If we are a radiating factor for Christ, wherever we are and whatever we do, and people say, there's an honest businessman. I want to do business with him. From this day, what day? The day you put God first. I will bless you. But you know we're the most materialistic society in the history of the whole wide world. I've probably read more history about the Roman Empire of the first century than any other phase of the world civilization. It was corrupt to the zenith, to the core, and outward. It was pitiful. Mosheim, the great German historian of church history, said it was a wicked, wicked world, that Roman Empire. And as you read a consensus of what he wrote, and I have it in an outline of Romans somewhere, uh, he said it's terrible. It's pitiful. You know some of the same things? Parents who mistreat their children and kill their children and starve their children. That's right in there. Man's inhumanity man is in that statement of the first century. It sounds just like the United States of America and the evening television news of today in our land and in our state and in our area of the state. Satan hadn't changed. Sin hadn't changed. And we wonder why we're going down the drain. And America's at its all-time weakest morally it's ever been. Because we haven't put God first. We haven't kept our promises to God. We're living beneath our privileges. When the day comes, we put God first. If that ever comes again, from this day, he'll bless us. From that very day, we'll see sunshine on the horizon instead of darkness. From this day will I bless thee. Now, we've got to do our part for that to be a pertinent, practical factor in our lives. And then the book of Zechariah. Run, speak to that young man. I want the young people here to sit up and listen to me now. I'm going to talk to you a minute. If I could run and catch up with all the young people in and out of the church, I'd say some things to them straightforwardly. I wouldn't try to be popular with them. I'd try to be right. I want to speak to the young women right now and their parents. Here's what I'd say to you if I could get you to slow down and you'd listen to me. Now, I hope you're big enough to listen instead of shutting me off because you need to hear what I'm about to say. I'd say to young women, be modest in your dress and in your conversation. Don't wear short shorts rolled up, as one preacher put it. Don't ever be immodest in your dress. Don't ever cause someone to lust after you because of the way you dress. Study your Bible and pray every day. Try to be a godly woman that godly men will see virtue in. Young men, you seek women Young women that are like that too. If you marry someone who's immodest in dress and in attitude and who caters to lewd music, sorry motion pictures, and most of them are, and don't get mad at me for just telling you the truth, most of what comes out of Hollywood comes straight from hell. Don't listen to those sorry tapes of the sorry 
popular people among your age group today. Because if you'd slow it down and turn it down and listen to the words, it speaks of disobeying parents, making fun of government, doing what you're very well pleased to do. It speaks of immorality to the highest degree. Every once in a while, a car will drive me at wind, drive by me at windows down. And whether mine are down or not, I can't keep from hearing what's on there. And it talks about immorality of every sort. And they're listening to that and enjoying that and tapping their feet to that. And that gets into their mind for we are what we think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And parents who allow that, lest their children get upset with them, are poor, sorry parents. You can't listen to that kind of junk and be pure and holy. I'm not your enemy when I tell you the truth. Now, some of you may say, I don't like what he's saying. I won't tell you this. I thought about it coming over here. And you have to listen to the, the whole story before you think I'm bragging on myself. I'm, I can only speak of my own experience that I know. When I was a senior in high school, I was a halfback for the third-rated team in the state of Texas. We beat Highland Park, who had been state champions the year before. Those six touchdown underdogs, we beat them 13 to 12, and I made both touchdowns. My picture was in the Dallas Morning News, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. I was in the Hall of Fame of high school football players. I mean, I was headed toward glory. We were playing in Fort Worth the next week, Arlington Heights, a state-ranked team. I came to school on Monday after being treated royally all weekend. And Mrs. Root, the English teacher, said, Johnny, that was a great game Friday night, but you won't play this Friday. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you didn't turn in your book report on time. You are failed this week. I said, you ought to be ashamed. You could have made an A. She said, you won't play this week. I'm scratching you from it with my own signature right today. She didn't like the coach a little bit. She didn't like a coach that thought football was why I went to school. She didn't like a coach that called the athletes out of her class and others to come to his office to talk about the next game. You know, I had the rare feeling that sports is what made the school go around, and I couldn't believe she's that dumb. You know the first teacher I went to see when I came back for a visit to my high school, Mrs. Root, and I thanked her to her face for teaching me a lesson that may have robbed me of some great things, but because she had the strength of character to do what was right, and she didn't care if I made 19 touchdowns. I failed her course that week. And the state of Texas says, you can't play the next week. I said, I admire you more than I can ever say. Because you did something I didn't like and thought I'd never get over. But it was a blessing in disguise. You taught me we go to school to get an education. And you taught me how to write. And I've used it in my preaching work. I thank you. And I really mean it. I've said that to say this. I could be your best friend by talking to you straightforward. I want you to go to heaven. I don't want you to get up there and say, that preacher could have told me about these things. Young men, date girls that are pretty spiritually. Make friends of those who are spiritually minded. Don't get down in the gutter with the dogs. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That means don't drink beer and other alcoholic beverages. Don't smoke. Don't go to dances. Don't do things that will build up your sensual life but not your spiritual life. Run, speak to these young people. Now what are you going to say when you catch up with them? Mealy mouth around? Apologize for truth? If you live long enough, you may come to me someday and say, I didn't like what you said a little bit, but it was the truth. And I'm old enough now and have matured enough now to know it was. I thought about it and pondered it and thought, boy, I wish that guy would sit down and hush. I've confused some people by just telling the truth, straightforward. Run, speak to that young man and young woman. But let me tell the other side of the story. I want to run and speak to you. I'm going to be real disappointed. Now, boys, listen to me. I'm going to be real disappointed if some of you are not gospel preachers someday. You have the ability, the talent. Those of you who have been raised right, and those of you who have risen above your background to think on spiritual levels, I will hope to sit someday and hear you preach. And I'll help you too. If you tell me someday I want to be a preacher, I'll give you some of my books. I used to have a huge library. Now it's very small because I've given away so many books to young preachers. And I don't regret it one of them. I want to study the book 
But there can be some helpful books along the way. But the point I'm making is the positive side of this, young ladies, be modest, be pure, be holy. And seek someone like to marry or just don't marry at all. Be better not to marry at all than marry someone. Well, he who marries a child of the devil will always have trouble with his father-in-law. The devil will see to that. Paul said, I have a right to lead about a wife who is a sister in Christ. 1 Corinthians 9 and 5. And he said to Christian widows, if you marry again, marry only in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7 39. Run, speak to that young man. Don't ever forget Zechariah chapter 2. And then we come to Malachi, the last one of the prophets, the messenger of God. That's what the name Malachi means. You know what he said in chapter 1? You're giving scraps to God. You're just giving leftovers to God instead of the first fruit. David said, I will not give unto the Lord that which costs me nothing, 2 Samuel 24, 24, and some brethren give nothing because they've spent all the rest of it on clothes and cars and fancy things and entertainment and sports, and they just drop in the scraps to God. What a tragedy. He said, if it's a weariness and a drudgery and a boredom to worship God, let's just shut the doors of the temple, the meeting place, and go home. And then he said, if you think what you're giving to God is such a nice thing, Give it to the governor of Persia and see what he'll think. Would you give that to an earthly ruler that you give to the God of heaven? I noticed the contribution today wasn't so good. It was real good last week. We've been above that $1,600, but we some people may not be giving what they could be giving. And they're giving scraps to God. And they have 111 excuses why they don't give as generously as they should and why he doesn't get the first part of all their money instead of the scraps. So when people see how they can dodge responsibility in contribution of time and energy and money and talent, that's a serious thing to rob God. Have you ever thought about that? I have someone that's indirectly kin to me that used to be a gospel preacher. I helped raise support for him in the northern United States in two different places, Pennsylvania and Montana. He and my sister have quit the Lord, and I could guarantee you why they, they've stopped and started and quit now 15 years or more they've been out of duty. And every one of their children don't even come close to being a New Testament Christian. And I guarantee you the reason he quit coming, it saved him $20 a week. Now that stinginess gone to seed. I believe if he ever comes back, genuine repentance would demand he make up what he stole from the Lord. I really believe that. If I miss several weeks and pocket that money and I don't give it to God, I don't mail it in or see that it's in the contribution of the Lord's work, if that's not robbing God, what is it? Some people have been out of duty for years and years and they owe the Lord what they purpose to give before they quit and the devil's gotten all that. But they had to sell their house or their car to make it up to God to prove they wouldn't rob God, they ought to do it. It never ceases to amaze me how people treat the Lord's work. For instance, when I or any other gospel preacher preach what the Bible says about giving, several people walk out sulking. If you doesn't quit preaching on giving, I just won't give anymore. That's really brilliant thinking there. If I back up what I say on that or any other subject with Scripture, you can't have that kind of attitude and go to heaven. And if I preach what people want to hear, the contribution would be $11.13. We've got to be taught, if we live up to our teaching, Bible teaching. Now, I understand some of you are going to give if I never preach on giving and give right. I understand that. But I'm talking about the ones who have a reluctance to appreciate what the Bible says on giving. They're looking for excuse not to give anymore. <laughs> Where giving ought to be the happiest thing we do in worship. God loves an hilarious giver. That's what cheerful means. That's where we get the word hilarious from the Greek word translated cheerful in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. And we'll never outgive God. He gave the best he had. He gave all heaven had. So when we speak of reciprocal giving, it's just as natural as breathing for a child of God. Now we need to see to it that the money that's collected is spent in saving souls and strengthening the church, edifying the brethren. We don't put it in a bank to gain interest. We're not in a banking business. We're in a soul saving business. If we have a little extra money built up, we need to... I already got a real good place where we can send it. I already... And not... I won't get a penny of it. But one of the best friends I've ever had that I baptized in 1978 in Austin, who has been with the World Video Bible School all these years, uh, he put all the money he gained in business into that work, is going to India, where he's been eight different times, but they're moving there. 
to train men in a school of preaching in Madras. It now has a different name, but that's what it used to be, Madras. I flew out of there years ago, out of coming back this way to Singapore and other places. And it's a huge city. They have a preacher training school right there. And he's been in all the villages where these men come from. You talk about a great guy to go that knows the work and how to get it done and is a very mature man. Uh, he and his wife are moving over there with the ideal state. I'd like to see us think about helping him. But the point I'm making is let's invest in the Lord's work and then as Ned prayed, get it out there on the field. It's great to be a part of a congregation that's looking for places to support. Let's keep on looking. Let's keep our eyes open. Can you see how practical these books are and why I love the prophets and preaching and teaching from them so much? But remember, beginning Wednesday night and next Sunday and the following Wednesday, we'll be discussing the Sermon on the Mount and maybe for two or three more weeks. Let us bow for a word of prayer before we sing this song. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the power of the message of the prophets. We're thankful for the practical applications to our lives. And we pray that we will so live and so endeavor to serve and please Thee that truth will never hurt our feelings but challenge us to do better. Help us to have the courage of conviction to stand up for what's right and never compromise. Help us to make the devil mad and the Lord happy in the way we live. Help us to be courageous enough to correct our own lives when we step aside from truth and to share with others the unsearchable riches of Christ that can sustain them through life if they will imbibe the truth. Help us as a congregation to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, to be the pillar and ground of truth, and to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to a lost and dying world. Help us to have our eyes open to world evangelism, and people we can help spread the good news, the glad tidings, and may we be a healthy, strong congregation locally. And may we do our very best to bring men to the Savior and be wise like those men years ago. Use us to thy glory and honor. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Won't you come as we stand and sing? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small.